Have you ever loved someone, a friend, a brother, a sister, someone who was in an abusive relationship, and especially the covert type where it was very hidden, very stealth, very sophisticated, very hard to recognize as abuse. And you sit down with your loved one and you say, listen, I think this is an abusive relationship. They said this, they said that, they did this and that. And you present these facts and evidence to this person and you even do it with compassion. What happens? Does that person just go, oh my God, thank you so much. I didn't realize, I see it now. No, that's not what happens. What happens is they don't believe you. In fact, they probably defend the abuser. And if you insist on showing them the truth, explaining with more facts and more evidence and using logic and reasoning, because you think that's what they need to realize what's going on, what happens is they might even attack you in order to defend their abuser and the fantasy that they're living in. So what's happening there? When you show a person the facts and evidence that contradict a perception of reality that they have, these two opposing ideas create an overwhelming mental stress that causes a short circuiting of the brain, which then defaults into denial. That's called cognitive dissonance. It's a primitive defense mechanism. They can't see it. They don't want to. They're too invested in the fantasy and what they want to believe. There's nothing you can say that will convince them. No amount of truth and facts and evidence will move anything for them at that point. You can only let go of your desire to wake them up. And you might think, well, maybe if I just ask them the right questions, I'll get them reflecting and they'll figure it out. They'll be able to see it. But what you'll notice is they have an excuse, an explanation, a rationalization for everything. So all you can really do is let go and let them figure it out for themselves. They will, eventually. They'll have that frying pan to the head lesson, that thing that's so devastating that it finally pierces their denial and they can't unsee it. We can't really wake people up from abuse. They have to figure it out for themselves. And then we can be there for them when they do and when they want more information. Will they one day look back and say, you know, I kind of knew it, but I didn't want to see it? Probably. Just about every client that I've worked with who was in a covert abusive situation said exactly that. I knew it from early on but I kept giving them the benefit of the doubt. I really didn't want to believe that it was abuse and it was so well disguised. So when does that moment of reckoning happen? No one really knows. It's a spontaneous thing that happens. If you think back to when you were in an abusive relationship of the covert type especially, there was probably an eventual moment when suddenly you realized Something is off. It's like in the movie Inception. If you've ever seen that, imagine the scene where they're sitting there at the tables outside. I think they're in Paris. And all of a sudden, the dream starts collapsing all around them. It's just everything is imploding. That moment in the covert abusive relationship is just like that. The illusion of your dream starts collapsing all around you. Suddenly, it's like All of your life is falling apart around you and you don't know what's real anymore. It's the same process in society, in the world. The patterns are the same on the micro and the macro levels, from interpersonal relationships, the family, companies and workplaces, social groups, cults, and the collective. Those who are awake to the gaslighting, the manipulation, the abuse, the cult programming, the surreal absurdity of everything going on right now, you are the ones watching your loved ones in an abusive relationship. I know how frustrating it is.
I know how sad it is to see. Try to remember to have compassion for them as you would someone you love who's in an abusive relationship because that's really what it is at the core. People are being manipulated and traumatized physically, psychologically, and spiritually. No doubt this will have long-lasting effects. While it seems really bad right now, I think there's also a silver lining. We have to see the good that can come of this. Otherwise, we'll get lost in the darkness. Just like in healing the personal trauma caused in abusive relationships, the patterns of collective healing are also the same. Trauma is devastating, yet it's also awakening. It is the initiation by fire into a new life a new way of being. The old world dies and the old self dies with it as you redefine who you are and you reconstruct the entire environment around you as you step into new potential. A lot of people want to go back to how it was. They want to go back to normal, to be who you were in the life you lived before the trauma. But unfortunately, that doesn't happen. You can never go back to how it was. Trauma is the ultimate red pill. Some people will go through the trauma and keep wanting to reach for the blue pill, to go back to sleep, to wake up in their bed the next morning like nothing happened, but that is only to delay the inevitable. Trauma is a calling to self-actualize. This is happening on an individual and collective level, as we are currently in the middle of multi-layered collective traumas. We are all being called to participate in this process with greater consciousness. For whatever reason, we are alive right now to witness and participate in the meltdown of our world that is underway and only just beginning. The illusions that society has lived in for a very long time now are all falling apart at the seams. There is no going back now. We have the opportunity to realize how we have been living in a false construct of reality, a false definition of self, a false definition of life. And as a species, we were really lazy to do something about it. I mean, we talk about change and evolution and making things better, but what have we really done about it? Many of the solutions we've tried have even made things worse. This is a turning point. It is either an opportunity to face the individual and collective shadows, to cleanse ourselves individually and the collective soul of humanity so we can liberate ourselves and create something better. Or it will be a path to hell, to increasing technocratic enslavement, to loss of liberty and life. Because when you're living as a slave, what's the point of life? The choice is ours. The choice starts with the individual. Everything starts with the individual. There is no changing the world out there for the better until each of us steps up and takes on the individual responsibility to transform ourselves. It starts within. This is not a cliche. This is perhaps the most important thing that we could embrace at this point. It is said that history repeats itself, and that is true. When we allow the past to continually contaminate the present, or when we don't heal the past. On an individual level, this is called repetition compulsion. We unconsciously repeat the same kinds of traumas and relationships and problems until we suddenly become aware of them and our own participation in them. With new awareness, we can make different choices to work on healing the parts of self that were programmed by the past so we can stop unconsciously choosing and accepting more of the same. The same is true on the collective level of humanity. 
we are currently at a crossroads. Future humans will one day look back and judge us as we judge those who came before us. What choices will we make in these defining moments in time? Will we continue to repeat history or will we make different choices? This turning point is a cultural crisis. It is a crisis of consciousness, a systemic and structural crisis that is reflected in our internal and in our external world. Have you noticed how everything that's been unfolding during the last year in the outside world is bringing up to the surface of you and your personal life things that you were previously unaware of? Maybe these are things that were always there, yet you hadn't paid attention before, but now they're pulling at your attention. And it's tempting to turn to distractions and numbing agents to not feel it. That's why alcohol sales are up 600% since March. Other emotionally numbing addictions are increasing too. Porn, overeating, opiates, social media, workaholism, toxic relationships, etc. It's not pleasant to feel what we don't want to feel. It will gnaw at your body, at your mind, at your soul, until you either numb it out or you feel it. This is a choice. It's your choice. Numbing it with distractions and addictions is like hitting the pause button. It doesn't go away. It simply delays the inevitable. The only way to heal it is to feel it fully, completely, and to meet that feeling with acceptance. I see you. I hear you. I feel you. And I accept you. That doesn't mean I have to stay in it. But the only way out is through. We can't ignore it. We can't ignore it any longer. We have to pierce the darkness with the light of awareness in order to heal it. Then we can process and integrate the lessons into consciousness. This turning point crisis is at the core, a crisis of our consensus of reality. The breakdown of the old mind programming and cultural assumptions is exposing the social engineering that started long ago and is now reaching exponential impact through advances in technology, smart devices, and social media. It has never been more apparent how our perception of reality is being curated through information control. We are in a full-on information war. If you haven't noticed this yet, then you aren't paying attention. Censorship is the control of information. It also has the indirect consequence of controlling thought. If you don't have access to the information, then you can't think about it either. If you're exposed to disinformation that's presented as information, then your ability to think is corrupted. Censorship is essentially mind control. Free speech leads to freedom of thought. If we don't defend this liberty, then our ability to think about reality is lost. Now it's easy to say, well, they're wrong and they're crazy. And maybe that's true and maybe it's not. But who is defining wrong and crazy? Think about a relationship that you may have had with an abuser, especially the covert type. They tell you that you're wrong, you're confused and you're crazy. Does that make it true? Be careful to consider this before you justify the silencing of voices and the disappearance of information. In an abusive relationship, the manipulator is controlling your perception of reality through gaslighting. They can even make you think that you're crazy. Gaslighting is a form of information control that leads to mind control. When someone has control over how you think and how you feel about yourself, about reality, they can provoke your emotions and then get you to react in the way that they want. Problem, reaction, solution. This is called behavior modification. At the collective level, provoking certain emotions to drive the behavior of the masses is called social engineering. 
when you're not driven by your own internal choice, but rather an automatic program installed from outside, then you have become an automaton, a robot, a drone, an extension of someone or something else. You will exist for the sole purpose of doing someone else's bidding. Those of you who grew up in a narcissistic family system know what this is. Since childhood, you were programmed by the family manipulators to think, to do, to be what they want. You had no right to determine who you are, what you think, what you say, and what you do. You existed merely to fill a role that someone else wrote for you in their story. You were an extension of the abuser to be commanded and used as they wished or else. So you conform in order to avoid punishment, exile, death. That's how they manufactured your consent. The tactics were many. Guilt tripping, shaming, smearing your character, inducing panic, preying upon your fears, dangling the carrot of hope, and continually moving the goalpost of expectations. Where one tactic didn't work, they would use another until one of them stuck. The tactics would continually escalate to keep you in line and in the trance. The abuse always escalates. A narcissistic family system functions like a cult. The same is true if you're working in an abusive office, a workplace, a social group, or in society at large. It's not just about one person. It is a whole system of abusers and enablers that functions as a single entity. Everyone in that system is under a hypnotic spell and is subscribed to a false reality. That unreality, which is implied to be reality, is what holds all the pieces together because everyone is subscribed to it. If you start to wake up from the illusion, the others will try to pull you back in. And it's very hard to maintain your sanity and your perception of reality when everyone around you is telling you that's not real and you're crazy to think such a thing. And if you insist, they will even attack you. When they can't argue against the facts and the evidence that you provide, they will attack your character. Those are called ad hominem arguments. By attacking your character, they discredit you as a person. Therefore, they dismiss the truth that you are telling without having to argue against the facts, evidence, and logic. You are not allowed to think for yourself in such a system. The key thing every cult does is to destroy your individual identity. This is usually done by inducing traumas. These can be via slow degradation, which is the covert form where they use tactics like guilt tripping, shaming, humiliating, fear inducing, smearing, bar setting in terms of what you must be, what you must say, how you must think, or else you're a bad person and you become enemy number one. And there are also the sudden shock techniques, which are the more overt forms that traumatize your mind and cause you to bond with others with whom you share the trauma-based experiences. Included in the shock techniques is information bombardment. You will be exposed relentlessly to emotionally provoking images and stories of events that trigger your fear, your empathy, your suffering, your exhaustion and confusion. This is the induction into the trance. Your fear becomes food and supply as those vampiric entities drain your life force. You won't be able to think clearly because you're in a brain fog. Thinking feels heavy, like a drag. So it's easier just to follow the herd, even when they're marching straight for the slaughterhouse. It becomes too hard to think, and to go your own way. It's too scary to be left alone. You'll have a paralyzing fear of being wrong or losing the protection of the herd. So you'll instead learn to rely on the authority figure and the group to tell you who you are and what to do. 
you'll believe their promises of virtue, safety, and security, and you'll give up nearly everything that matters to you for those promises. As your individual identity is shattered through these traumatic experiences, it will be replaced by the group identity. You will lose your ability to think for yourself as a sovereign being, and instead, you'll begin to subscribe to the group think as your default program. You'll follow the group instead of thinking for yourself. This is how people have been led to think, believe, and do insane things in cults. Now from the outside, it's very easy to see the insanity of it all. But when you're in it, you really believe it. And you actually think that you're doing the right thing that's helping others. Ask anyone who has defected a cult. They'll tell you that they truly believed that what they were doing was right and was something that was good for others. If you've ever woken up within a family or other cult-like social system where there was abuse, then you're probably recognizing the similarities to where we are in society right now. That realization can be terrifying. And unfortunately, unlike the family and other social groups, We can't escape this one entirely because it is the entire structure and system of the world in which we live. We are all dependent to some degree on that system. We forget that we can create new systems, new structures that honor the sanctity of life, love, and liberty. Again, it all starts within the individual. One of the biggest lessons that I learned in 2020 was about control. When things are changing out of your control, you either adapt or die. Included in death is living as a slave because that is a form of soul death. To live like that, what's the point? You become like the living dead. The world is changing and we are all changing with it but it doesn't have to be like the social engineers want us to. Rather, how you as an individual choose, how you define yourself and what most matters. Who are you? I don't mean your job title, your race, your gender, your class, your nationality, or any other superficial stuff. I mean, who are you really? When all of that is stripped away, and you are left standing in the nakedness of your being. The only definition that matters is your own. That's what's real. Your direct experience is real. You are allowed to think for yourself, to define yourself, and to define your reality. You don't have to subscribe to what someone else tells you is real or who you have to be. Why would you give the authority of your life over like that? Evil will tempt you to sell out your direct experience to an authority figure who defines you and your reality in exchange for approval, security, and status. As Terence McKenna would say, stop outsourcing direct experience. It all depends now on the individual choices that we make because as individuals, we make up the collective. It starts within. It comes down to your personal responsibility over your life and your contribution to the world. Self-responsibility is your empowerment. That has always been the core message of my work in self-healing after narcissistic abuse. I've taken a lot of time out of the public eye to turn inward during the last year. It wasn't planned actually intended on doing speaking events tour and to finally launch the retreats that I'd been planning for years last year. But all of that is indefinitely on pause due to the changes in our world. Everyone's plans were drastically changed last year. We were all forced to reevaluate what really matters, who we are individually, what we are doing in this world, what kind of world we want to live in, and which people we choose to walk this journey with, and so much more. I made a lot of changes in my life during the last eight months or so in terms of my relationship with myself, 
my relationship with God and with the world around me. I decided to uproot my life in Mexico and I chose to move to Texas where I have been slowly growing new roots. It's dangerous to be unrooted during a storm because you can get blown away in the wind. I don't want to be speaking publicly, dealing with the trolls and the haters and those who want to tell me who I have to be and what I have to say and the role that I have to fill in their story. I was exhausted and I didn't have the internal strength yet. I needed time. I didn't have answers yet. I didn't have answers for myself or anybody else. Roots don't just instantly grow. It takes time. You have to carefully prepare the right soil and environmental conditions to grow healthy roots in the right place. I kept thinking, I'll just get right back out there. But my intuition and the synchronicities kept turning my gaze again inward toward myself, toward God, and toward my immediate surroundings. Soon I'll send an email out to my list about the main lessons that I learned in 2020 and how those lessons might apply in your life. And if you're not on my email list yet and you want to stay in touch, there's going to be a link in the video description below and probably somewhere up in the right hand corner of the video to opt into that list. That's really the best way to stay in touch for now as we are seeing extreme unpredictability on social media platforms lately. And by the way, these social media platforms are not the place to speak truth anymore. The farther in the direction of evil they go with censorship, the more people will start walking away. And of course, they will likely keep trying to shut down public discourse that does not conform to the official narrative. They will also likely keep shutting down alternative platforms and ways of communication. And while they might have the upper hand for some time at first, eventually, People will innovate new ways of sharing information that can't be censored and canceled. Meanwhile, there's email. For any and all creators that you want to hear from, people you follow on YouTube, podcasts, and whatnot, make sure you're subscribed to their email list sooner rather than later. You know, email can get redirected to spam and junk sometimes by your email provider. I hear that frequently from people. So be sure to mark those emails from your favorite creators as safe or favorites, whatever the little star thing is in your email provider to make sure that they land in your inbox and don't go to the spam folder. We are at war. This isn't just a pandemic. The battleground of this war is physical in some ways, but mostly it's psychological and spiritual. We are being told this is the new normal. New normalism is the cult. Culture tells a society what is normal. It could be totally fucked up, but accepted as normal because it's what people do. It becomes a collective hallucination, a collective psychosis. People truly start to believe that that's what's real and that's what's right. It's easy for us to judge those who came before us as amoral. Remember, at one time society believed that such atrocities, such as slavery, were normal. And here we are again, as those who challenge the amoral normality of society are being demonized. If you think that you're standing up against the oppressor, against slavery, and on your side is all of the media, big tech, all the massive corporations, Hollywood, I'm sorry, but you are confused. You don't know history. You have no idea what happened to those who stood up against such things. They weren't celebrated. Their voices weren't elevated. They were persecuted, smeared, shamed, tortured, and even killed. And here we are again. How far will it go this time? Culture. Notice the root word. Cult. Notice the language structures. I've always had a fascination with language. That's why I speak five languages and I'm learning another one right now. Speaking languages gives me access to understand the perception of reality of others, of more people than if I only spoke my native language and I was depending on other people to speak my language with me. Language patterns and words reveal our cultural values and perceptions. When words and phrases are repeated, 
they also lock us in to a consensus reality. Reality is made of language constructs. The Greek word is logos. The manifest world is made of language. In the beginning was the word, and the word was made flesh. Language holds together our perception of reality. So if we want to unsubscribe from the trance, we must start by rejecting the language that creates that reality construct. Censorship is the control of information, the control of minds, the control of reality. Without free speech, your ability to think about and define your reality is lost. And so we end up in a collective psychosis. It seems real because everyone is in it, but it's not reality. It's just a construct. Language is how we convey information. Who controls the language, controls the information, controls the perception of reality. Notice the perversion of language. This didn't start in the last year. It's been like this for a very long time. I actually started following these trends about 18 years ago. I was researching and observing the extreme covert psychopathic abuse in society long before I knew what narcissistic abuse was on a personal level. It's not new. It's just on steroids now, greatly amplified. This isn't even the first attempt they've made for global control using a bug. In 2009, they tried the same thing. I tried to warn people then too. Back then there was no social media. That was all just in its infancy at the time. And I think that's why it didn't work. And I think that's why it worked now. Back then, when you wanted to share information, you sent out an email to everyone that you knew. So I did that to the whole 20 or so people that I knew. And surely, most of them thought that I was crazy, as many do now. And that's okay. I'm not afraid of being called crazy. Truth tellers are often labeled as such. New normalism came with the introduction of new phrases and context of words that are being used around the world in all languages. Certain messages and phrases are being repeated. Double speak, which is when you use certain flowery, pretty language to disguise the truth, or when you use words to mean their exact 180 degree opposite. Double speak is being used to create double think. These terms come from George Orwell. If you haven't read the book 1984 yet, I highly recommend it. It's like a playbook for what they're doing. Just imagine some of the concepts translated into our modern world. Instead of the telescreen, we have cell phones. But so were other dystopian novels. A playbook for what's happening right now. Those dystopian novels mostly came from the post-World War II era. Orwell, Bradbury, Huxley, and Rand. They all saw where it was going 70 years ago. Double speak and double think causes cognitive dissonance. This is part of the hypnotic induction into the cult. Everyone starts using certain confusing phrases that induce a certain perceptual state of reality. Artificial bonds between cult members are created through these phrases and the sharing of trauma experiences that they represent. Social distancing is really isolation. Quarantine is really something for the sick. When you're not sick, it's confinement. We are all in this together. It's just code for the rules are for us peasants, not the elite. In cults, a sense of family is fabricated via humiliation, fear, torture, loss, cruelty, isolation, confusion, and the shared trauma. The rules are nonsensical and absurd. What they call science nowadays is for the most part just another cult bought and paid for by the social engineers to show what they want and it's full of gaslighting. 
Science is the new religion. That's why doctors challenging the narrative are being censored during a pandemic. If someone had told you just one year ago that you wouldn't be able to see your family, to go to church, or even to work to feed your family because your job is considered non-essential, you would have thought that was crazy. Yet here we are. This is the new normal, they tell us. There is nothing normal about new normalism. We are being lobotomized. If you hate what I'm saying and you hate me now, that's fine. I'm not here to play a role that you want for me in your story. You can unsubscribe at any time. But if you're listening to this and it's making sense to you, please share this with anyone else that you think could benefit from this message. Understand, I am not telling you to be reckless or to throw caution to the wind. I'm telling you that you can choose to do independent research on things, to think for yourself instead of just believing what self-designated authority figures are telling you. Then you can choose which precautions make the most sense for you and your family. I am simply encouraging you to stop participating in the collective psychosis. That starts with thinking for yourself. Don't just believe what others tell you, including me. Do your own research and don't be lazy. This is about your future and the future of your children. Find alternative sources of information. Listen to all sides. Talk with others who are willing to have difficult yet civil conversations to sprout new ideas and insights. Then, Evaluate through your direct experience what makes the most sense to you. Whatever you do, do not resort to violence. That is not the answer. That is what the social engineers want us to do, because then they have an excuse to strip away more civil liberties and blame it on us. 2021 will be the year that we wake up to the gravity of this crisis, individually and collectively, or not. I see it though. I think a lot of people are getting fed up. They're done being treated like an infantilized, dirty, dumb slave who doesn't have the brains to think for themselves. Yet even if everyone woke up right now, we would still have the challenging work of trauma recovery to do. All of us are being affected by the layers of trauma. There are the individual past traumas that are being triggered as the social engineers pluck each of the strings of the current traumas. Then there is the collective trauma that is affecting each of us. Those who will bear the greatest burden of these traumas are the children. They're having their development and childhood stolen from them, just as kids do in narcissistic family systems or other spiritual and religious cults. They will be affected into adulthood in ways we can't even entirely imagine yet. What we know for sure is they are being programmed to be afraid of others and to see others as dirty and dangerous. The youngest of the children now won't even remember life before new normalism. They were born into this trauma matrix. We were all born into a trauma field as far back as we can trace in history, but what's happening now is next level. It is affecting nearly everyone around the world and we are only starting to see the fallout. The policies created to deal with the bug will end up having a worse devastation on human life individually and collectively than the bug itself, guaranteed, no matter how much they try to manipulate you through guilt tripping to think the opposite. We can't change the exterior without first looking inside. So what can you do now? The answer is the same now as it is for the journey of self-healing after narcissistic abuse. In order to end the legacy of abuse, we first have to set the boundaries that starve the parasites of supply and then take responsibility over our personal life. The parasites include the psychopaths, the humans, the archons, the non-human entities, and the inorganic artificial intelligence that is learning from everything you post online, from anything you say or write on your phone, or even within reach of its microphone, 
and even from the nanotechnology that you allow them to inject in your body. All of the data that they harvest is going into the quantum computer that they're using to run probability scenarios of how we will react individually and collectively to the trauma strings that they're plucking. And when they run out of supply, they will have to move on to another dimension. If we continue to feed them, stronger they will grow. So I have some tips for you for taking personal responsibility at this time. Number one, call things by their name. Words have meaning. Choose them carefully. Stop parroting the words and phrases that you hear in the news or on social media. Your words are creating the structure of your reality. Number two, take an inventory of your values. Find out what really matters to you. Then create standards and boundaries to protect your values. This will help you raise your self-worth. Self-worth makes you immune to the abuse because you value your direct experience more than what someone else is telling you that you have to believe in or do or be. If you want help with that, I have a short course to walk you through this process called Raising Your Self-Worth. The link is in the video description below. I'll also put it in the upper right-hand corner of the video. Your values are the foundation of your identity, as well as your relationship with yourself, plus all of your other relationships. Your values serve as an important filter for you to discover who belongs in your inner circle or not, who is moving forward with you and who is not. Number three, create your individual identity. People have all kinds of opinions and entitlements about who you are and who you should be. They will try to force you into a box or a role that they created for you. Let them. That doesn't define you. You do not exist to fill the role that someone else wrote for you. You get to write your own story and you can choose to rewrite it at any time. Even if you were following someone else's story all your life, you don't exist for the will of others. You are not here to sacrifice yourself for others. That is soul cannibalism, no matter how pretty the words they use to try to guilt trip you into such acts. Number four, question what you hear. And that includes what I'm saying. Don't take my word for it. Do independent research. And not just what you read or see, but what you experience for yourself. That is what's real. Use your critical thinking skills to exercise that muscle if it has atrophied. You are the sovereign authority over your life. You can listen to other perspectives. You can discern the wheat from the chaff, and then you can choose what makes sense to you, not what someone else chose for you. You can withdraw your consent at any time. Number five. Embark upon the difficult inner work of trauma recovery. It is long and it is painful, but it is worth it. An important step in that direction is to develop greater presence. Trauma causes us to live frozen in the past. As you become more present with yourself in the here and now moment, you will develop greater consciousness and be able to reintegrate the body-mind-spirit fragmentation that occurs from the trauma. We have a lot of work to do, and the sooner we get started, the better. My final words for you, they are selling us an illusion, and they expect us to buy it. But what will they do if we don't want it? Subscription to the illusion is optional. If you don't like it, unsubscribe.